Okay. <clears throat> Shoot, did I hit record? Yes, I did. Okay. It's going to be part four, I think. Yeah, part four. Let's print more stuff. Oh, dear. We just had the freaking intelligent docking mana blade. There's a Ferdinand's voice. Oh, my God. They weren't expecting that. None of us were. Several days have passed since the world was cursed with the birth of Angelica's lecture blade, but it turned out to be quite the interesting little thing. While it acted and spoke like Ferdinand, it was completely lacking in knowledge. It was supposedly meant to absorb information through its surroundings and by having its master, Angelica, teach it things, but this meant she was stuck getting lectured by a sword that knew even less than she did. Wow. That's saying something, apparently. Because from what everybody is saying, Angelica is, well... An airhead. Or rather not or worse than an airhead. I should say. So it lectures you but nothing much comes from it. That sounds terrible. And I, I, I muttered, muttered on the inside. The mana blade gleamed in response. What my master must first do is imbue me with knowledge. It declared in a haughty tone resembling Ferdinand in attitude alone. Well then, Angelica, I suppose you'll need to study in order to help your mana blade accumulate knowledge, I observed. Stenluck would actually remember things, unlike me, so the time spent teaching him will undoubtedly be worth it. Stenluck? 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 Angelica smiled. That's his name, she said, stroking her mana blade. Given its intelligence, she had apparently decided naming it was necessary. Damn you, who had been looking down uncomfortably at the mana blade as it spoke in Ferdinand's voice, shifted his gaze to Angelica and crossed his arms. In that case, I suppose you will want us to go through a crash course on four of your lessons to prepare your weapon, he added. He asked, adding under his breath, it should make it mu much easier this time, given since we won't have to repeat ourselves over and over again for you to understand. Cornelius nodded in agreement. Right. My brother had some notes on four of your lessons among the study materials he gave us. Preparing in advance so that you aren't knocked off your feet again would indeed be wise, Bridget added. Angelica listened to everyone's opinions while nodding solemnly, then nodded then suddenly looked up with a glint in her blue eyes. She faced Daniel and held out the sword. Daniel, I leave the rest to you. Good luck, Stenluk. My master, you yourself must do the studying, the monoblade exclaimed. I cannot hear the voices of others without mana flowing through me, and if all the lessons are to be taught to me, then your mana will certainly not last. It seemed that Angelica lacked the mana to keep the sword animated all day, which would be necessary if she wanted it to take lessons in her place. Her eyes widened like saucers as she gripped the monoblade in shock, so I'll, I'll never be able to escape from studying. No, you will not! I know you don't like studying, but you got to! Of course not, you fool! The sword barked in a very familiar fashion. It was so similar to Ferdinand that I was honestly a little impressed. <laughs> this was some monoblade. Hopefully it will keep up the good work and actually get its master to study. I suppose I should compose a study plan so that Angelica and Stenluke can learn together, Damiel amused aloud. Thank you for your efforts, I said. While Damiel and Cornelius got to work writing up a plan for Angelica, I started digging into the pile of study material myself. Sure, they were only lessons, guides, and study in classroom notes, but they were lines of text that I hadn't read yet. And since my very, first, my very purpose in life was to read, I had to delve in, delve in at once. I read through the four pure materials that Eckert had given us, reminiscing about how blissful it had been, always been to start a new school term, school year, and be given a ton of unfamiliar textbooks. It looked like Eckert had often asked Ferdinand for help while he was staying at the Royal Academy, judging by the comments and explanations written in his handwriting here and there amid the documents. My brow knitted in thought, so Bridget, do you think I could sell study resources to students using Ferdinand and Eckert's materials as a base? I asked, even in my Irvana days, the notes of top students have been worth a lot of money. Surely these resources will be exceptionally valuable, considering this world didn't have textbooks, quite like ours, with lessons seemingly being based around lectures. I do believe they would sell well. However, Bridget glanced over at Daniel, Daniel amusement visible in her amethyst eyes. I followed her gaze to see that he was frowning anxiously. Do you have a problem with this, Daniel? Writing out notes on boards to sell and attending classes for others in order to transcribe lectures for them are some of the few ways for lay nobles at the Royal Academy to earn disposable income. If you started to distribute study resources based on Lord Ferdinand and Lord Eckert's notes, 
I am certain there are many students who will end up losing out. I couldn't just go and quash a valuable source of money for poor students. Before I went about selling study resources myself, I would need to find an alternative for them. I thought it would be a good way to boost the education level in Erinfest, but I see that I will need to think about it more carefully first. Thank you. As we continued our discussion, an ordinance flew in for Bridget. The ivory bird flapped its wings, landed on her wrist, and then began speaking in Ferdinand's voice. It seemed that the Plantin Company had requested a meeting with me. There was something they wanted to discuss before summer came. Since I had Earth Days off, there was enough le leeway for me to return to the temple. Oh my god. Why? <sighs> Hello? <sighs> Since I had Earth Days off, there was enough leeway for me to return to the temple. I had Bridget make a reply ordinance, which I then spoke to. This is Rosemine. Once I have completed fr uh, Fruit Day's mana replenishment, I shall return to the temple until Water Day, where I am required for the next one. Please inform Gil that I would like to meet the planting company in the morning on uh, Water Day. There is work here for you to complete on Earth Day as well, Ferdinand responded in turn. Come to my room at Third Bell. And with that, my entire weekend disappeared. I had been spending so much of my time in the castle casually reading lately that I pro would probably have had a hard time readjusting to this new schedule. That night at dinner, I informed Bonifatis and Fashes and Wolford of my weekend plans. I'll be absent from the castle after mana replenishment on fruit day to check the workshop and orphanage in the temple. I shall return in time for mana replenishment on water day. I see. Do not overdo it, Bonifacio said with a nod, having being a man of relatively few words. He looked a lot like Hardstad, quite broad-shouldered and rather muscle-bound for someone his age, though he was much more blunt and often had a sharp gleam in his eyes. I even found him a little scary, but I had assur been assured by Cornelius that he actually had an enormous soft spot for me, which was impressive given that it was apparently rare for him to show any concern for the well-being of others when my brothers got sick. He would normally just bark at them for being frail and weak. Wow, I guess because you're a girl? Maybe? In my case, Bonifacius had been warned by Carset that as much as a shout could cause me to literally drop dead, and after realizing how sickly I really was from my multiple fainting episodes in the castle, he was doing his best to keep his distance, terrified about being anywhere near a child who would collapse from something as minor as being struck by a single faithful snowball. <laughs> that explained why he always seemed to be avoiding me to some degree. You'll really be okay traveling to the temple by High Beast after performing the mana replenishment? You're strong in the weirdest of ways, Rosemine. Running, ar running around is enough to almost kill you, but somehow you can handle mana replenishment without batting an eye. Wolfrey grumbled with a frown. Just moving Mana from the face stones was enough to exhaust him, so he found it hard to believe that I could travel to the temple right after performing the replenishment. Mana and stamina are two very different things, I replied tersely. It helped that I was used to moving Mana w around my body, and since I used Mana for those things all the time, I never ended up with too much built up inside of me. Compared to me co my commoner days when I was forced to endure my Mana always swelling to bursting point, life was good. And so came Fruit Day. I returned to the temple after finishing the usual mana replenishment, by which time it was late enough for Seventh Bell. Welcome back, Lady Rosemine. My line, lined up attendants greeted me. I was suddenly overwhelmed with nostalgia, like it had been ages since I had last seen them. I have returned. Has anything changed in my absence? When I returned to my chambers, I was led directly to an already prepared bath. Then, once I had been washed, it was time to receive my pre bed reports. Oh, hold on. Let me just make sure. Okay, just making sure that this was still recording. Fran served me some tea before joining Zom to speak first. Since they had managed the High Bishop's Chambers while I was gone, and together with Monica, they reported no notable changes aside from going to the High Priest's Chambers rather than the High Bishop's to do work. That said, while your chambers remain unchanged, the temple as a whole has been transforming little by little, Fran began. Now that Brother Camphor and Brother Freytick are highly valued by the High Priest for their assistance, several Blue Priests have begun to show an interest in administrative work. Some continued. The blue priests who had previously found themselves in a neutral position reportedly observed Camphor and Freetick, then approached Ferdinand to join them. He had subsequently determined that there was no harm in recruiting them, considering their former neutrality, and began training them as well. 
These priests have spent much, most of their lives doing nothing even close to resembling work, so they were being put through the ringer in the same way as Camphor and Freetic, who watched the new recruits with warm eyes while remembering having endured the same hellish trials themselves. <laughs> oh, the good old days <laughs> of hell. The high priest has been brimming with life lately. He also consumes dramatically fewer of those potions you were so worried about him relying on, Fran said. Which is good! No doubt due to the fact that he can now entrust his work to others. It feels as though he finally has some breathing room in his schedule. Ferdinand being able to complete his work without relying on potions meant that his successors were being trained at a reasonable pace. I can imagine the Blue Priests were having a rough time due to his brutal training methods, but all's well that ends well. Gil, Fritz, how goes the workshop, I asked, my eyes drawn to the new picture book in Gil's hand. When Fran and Zom done, it was their turn to give reports, and what I wanted to know more than anything was how printing was advancing in the workshop. Noticing my gaze, Gil grinned and held out the book. We had finished the picture book on the winter subordinates, he announced. I took the book and stroked its cover, which was not covered with scattered red petals and looked very fancy. Red was, of course, the divine color of winter. I then brought the book to my face and rubbed my cheek against it, inhaling the sharp scent of ink that it pierced my senses. It was a heavenly smell that made me melt right then and there. After enjoying that brief moment, I lined one of each picture book stored in my chambers on the table. There was one book for the king and queen alongside the Eternal Five, then one for each of the individual uh, seasoned subordinate gods. The children's picture Bible set was complete, and an emotional sigh unconsciously escaped my lips. Ah, there's nothing quite so pristinely beautiful as a complete set of books. How splendid. Shall we pray to the gods in honor and appreciation of my Gutenberg's praise be to... Gutenberg's praise be to Mestin... Mestinor, the goddess of wisdom, and Kuntzeel, the goddess of art, I declared, shooting both arms into the air. Gail gave a big nod, his deep purple eyes shining proudly. I knew you would like it, Lady Rosemine. Well done, Gail, well done. I am blessed to have such fine workers as attendants. Now, what shall we print next? We must keep up the pace and produce an ever-growing catalog of books. <laughs> Fran sighed with exasperation, placing a gentle hand on my shoulder. Lady Rosemine, you are getting too excited. Please contain yourself. Zom and Fritz are becoming unsettled. Even though I had only let out a sliver of my true feelings, both Zom and Fritz were visibly uncomfortable wearing stiff expressions as they averted their eyes. Both of you, this is how Lady Rosemine normally reacts when presented with books, Fran explained. Please get used to it sooner rather than later. Ignoring that, I stacked up the picture books and hugged them to my chest, carrying them over to the nearby bookcase where I delicately, delicately started lining them up. The fact that I could step back and admire a full row of books in my own room was enough to make me sigh with bliss. Ah, it's so wonderful. Could there be anything better than both the book rooms and my own chamber simultaneously filling with new books? I completely agree on that one, girl. I'm a big fan of books, too. Not to the extent that you are, though, but yeah. How should I express my joy at more and more being brought into existence? I would like to share this bliss with everyone in the world, I mused aloud. Won't you be doing that by selling the books after the Starbine ceremony, Gil asked? You know what? That's a great way to put it. I looked up with glistening eyes. Indeed, I will share it with everyone, but I would also like to use this opportunity to create more books as well. Gil, do you think you would be able to finish the collection of night stories before the Starbine ceremony? Gil tilted his head and thought counted something in his fingers, then shook his head regretfully. We finished three of the short stories, but I don't think we have enough time to print them all. Both typesetting and proofreading takes a significant amount of time, so we could perhaps finish two more short stories at best, Fritz added, taking out the half-finished collection. Ro Lady Rosemond, how would you recommend we bind these together? Would you have each story bound individually, or have all of them combined into one? Please advise. I skimmed the three available night stories while considering the best way to sell them. Given that each individual customer will be ordering whatever covers they like, regardless of what method we chose, there will almost certainly be no problem with us binding the short stories individually. Plus, it was possible that someone might only be able to afford a single story rather than the entire collection. Bind each short, short story individually. If you would, I, would I shall sell whatever we have ready by the Starbind ceremony. As you wish. Lady Rosemine, now that the picture books are finished, the mimeograph printing printers are available again. Is there anything else you would like to print? If there's something you need, we shall make sure it is done, Gail said very heroically. I pulled open one of my desk drawers and took out my list of potential books that I wanted to make. Text-heavy books look neater and overall more visually appealing when produced with letterpress printers, 
So we should use the mimeograph bo mimeographs for books that predominantly contain illustrations, charts, and the like. I wonder what I should print then, I wondered, pondered aloud. If we were going to be selling whatever I decided on after the Starbine ceremony, then I would want to produce something that met the needs of adults, in contrast to the products I had sold in the winter playroom. Perhaps I could print the recipe books and sheet music that I had previously considered putting off until I had more leeway. Recipes and sheet music are well suited for mimeograph printing, but I should discuss this matter with Ferdinand before anything else. I didn't have that much time to spend in the temple, and trying to complete everything that I wanted to do meant that I was going to be exceedingly busy. I needed to help Ferdinand in his chambers from Third Bell tomorrow anyway, so I decided to use that opportunity to ask about the recipes and sheet music. Once I had voiced these plans to Fran while writing them down on my diptych, I slid into bed. Had I been in the castle this Earth Day, it would have been a wonderful day off spent be holed up in the book room, but it was always the same old routine in this temple. At Third Bell, I promptly headed to Ferdinand's chambers. Excuse me, Ferdinand. Ah, there you are. Now, allow me to introduce you to the blue priest who I've since began working here, Ferdinand said as he glanced up from his paperwork. A few blue priests I had barely ever seen before stepped their own, stopped their own work to kneel. They seemed to be the ones Ferdinand was in the middle of training since they were currently battling through stacks upon stacks of boards with their calculators just as I had done in the past. Well, minus the calculator, of course. Once Ferdinand had finished introducing me to the blue priest, he asked about life in the castle, which I meant, which meant I could finally get to the point. I excitedly leaned onto the desk and began to talk about the books I wanted to make. I finished all my picture books about the gods, so I was thinking of using the mimeograph printers to create collections of sheet music and recipes next. May I print and sell a book of the songs you played at the concert, I asked. While I had, of course, been the one to introduce these songs to this world in the first place, it was Ferdinand and Rosina who arranged my humming into sheet music that could be played on the harsh peel. Ferdinand gave a light shrug. They are not my songs, so as long as you do not couple them with any unwelcome illustrations, you do may do with them as you like. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you could do that at least. It's not an illustration, it's just your name. Oh, but I was going to put your name in the credits as the composer. I'm yet unable to write sheet music, and it's thanks to you that the song is playable on the harsh peel at all. I merely arranged your humming. I did not compose any songs, and thus should not receive such recognition, Ferdinand replied firmly. But I didn't want to identify myself as the composer either. I was simply remembering the songs from my Arano day, so I certainly couldn't claim to have composed them. How can I call myself a composer when I can't even play the songs, I sighed. Composing and playing are two entirely different sections. Or different actions. If you were to include credits, keep them accurate. My plan had been to push the showy position onto Ferdinand, but he blocked me entirely. It was no issue, though. I would simply list Ferdinand and Rosina as the arrangers in big letters, then credit myself as the inspiration in much smaller letters beneath them. Incidentally, I would also like to make a book titled Rosemine's Ravishing Recipes. Is there anything I should know in advance? You may print a book of recipes, but wait until next winter to put it up for sale. You would also do well to sell them at a time when all the nobles are gathered together, draw their attention with new recipes this Starbine ceremony, then spread rumors of the recipe book and its price. It should be an expensive product, unlike your other books. I hadn't yet settled on a final price for the recipe book. It would probably be wise to meet with Benno to decide whether I should keep it in line for how much Sylvester had paid for the books, or pay for the recipes, or sell limited editions to give a premier feeling and jack up the price. In that case, I shall prepare to print the sheet music and recipe book. Would it be okay for me to have Rosina write out the sheet music? Indeed, she will most likely be perfect for the job, but Ferdinand said, granting his permission I rot immediately. He had seen Rosina's work firsthand when arranging my humming with her, so he knew that she had both beautiful handwriting and a strong grasp on music theory. Is that all you have to report? If so, begin to work your work. There is quite a lot of math that has built up. And so I faced my first mountain of boards in a long time, scrawling away at a, sl at a slate as I worked through them. Meanwhile, the newbie blue priests widened their eyes and muttered that I was simply too good. It seemed they weren't yet working fast enough to satisfy Ferdinand. Do not just watch her. You are already slow enough. The least you can do is work without such unnecessary pause as Ferdinand chastised, not even looking up from his own work. The blue priests inhaled sharply and quickly got back to moving their calculators. They still weren't used to using them, and their movements were clumsy enough that I could guess that it would be quite some time before they actually started speeding up. Fourth bell rang soon enough, signaling that it was time for lunch. I returned to my chambers, having finished my calculating work, and quickly approached Rosina, who was playing Hartsfield. Rosina, I would like to entrust you with writing out sheet music, I said. Ferdinand has already given me his permission. 
She paused mid-strum, blinked several times, and slowly tilted her head. As always, she moved with such grace that even the simplest gestures appeared utterly breathtaking. What sheet music, might I ask? Sheet music for all the songs that Ferdinand played at his Parspiel concert. I'm going to sell them as a book, so I ask that you transcribe them as carefully as you can. Please also write the song titles and arrangers' names in beautiful letters. As you wish, I shall draw the finest sheet music I can so that I may live up to what is expected of me as your personal musician. Rosina gracefully accepted the job, which, I was, which was unsurprising since she generally loved to do anything involving music. I asked her to include Ferdinand as the arranger, putting my name on the inspir as the inspiration in small letters beneath it. Right, I, sh I also add... I also add more mute sheet music for songs of my own arrangement, she asked, or might I ask, may I add them. She asked, placing a thoughtful hand on her cheek and momentarily averting her gaze. I, of course, accepted the suggestion with open arms. Absolutely. The more books we can have, the better. Once you have completed the sheet music, please pla pass it all to Fritz and Gil. I have informed them to begin printing as soon as everything is ready. I understand that you are excited, Lady Rosemary, but please eat lunch before discussing printing matters, Fran interjected, dousing my excitement with cold water. In a way, he sounded like my mother from my Irano days. She was always equally exasperated when I ended up too absorbed in my reading that I forgot to eat. I suppose you're right, I said with a light shrug before taking my seat at the table. That was when Nicola came in carrying our food. Lady Rosemine, lunch is more size, more elaborate today due to Hugo's assistance. He competed with Ella by preparing many of the new recipes he learned for the Italian restaurant. I'm quite looking forward to the leftovers, she said happily as she lined up the plates. That reminded me. There was something I wanted to ask her. Nicola, I have decided to make a recipe book for my favorite foods. Oh my, a recipe book? Nicola replied, clapping her hands together in excitement. I can't wait for more people to get to enjoy this delicious food. I proceeded to ask her to help Hugo and Ella to write out the recipes I had taught them. This would have been a lot simpler had I been able to speak to the chefs myself, but it wasn't easy for the adopted daughter of an archduke to just waltz into the kitchen. I would like to discuss this with Hugo and Ella in more detail, but first, they need to finish writing down the recipes. Furthermore, I wonder whether they could separate the relatively traditional, easier-to-make foods from the more unique, complex ones that require more preparation. Once we decide on the exact recipes, we can... Lady Rosemine, as I've said, please wait to discuss printing until after lunch, Fran repeated, gripping the pitcher of water in his hand with a co icy cold smile. This isn't good. My apologies. I shall begin eating at once, I said, picking up my cutlery. Nicola, sensing Ma Fran's wrath, quickly retreated to the kitchen while talking about preparing the next course. No sooner had I taken my first bite of a seasonal salad and started chewing than yet another thing came to mind. Monica, forgive me for only just remembering this, but please go to the workshop and borrow the needles and thread necessary for binding books. Lady Rose, my printing talk meet must wait. This isn't printing talk. It's book binding talk. Or, um, rather, preparation for my afternoon plans, I replied, hurriedly attempting to justify myself. Fran started rubbing his temples. He really was similar to Ferdinand, who I was certain would be launching some sharp rebukes my way right about now had he been here. Maybe this likeness had become so much more evident lately because while I was staring at the castle, Fran was doing his work in Ferdinand's chambers. After seeing Monica out of the room, I continued my meal, okay, actually staying quiet this time. Only once I was finished could we really finally start bookbinding. I bound the collection of Mom's stories that I had gradually piece been gradually piecing together since winter, the cover art of which was a family illustration I had drawn myself. It had been done in a cartoony style, which I wasn't sure the people of this world would look upon too fondly, but I had no other choice since I didn't have any photos to use. Uh... Oh, this is for, uh... This is the one-of-a-kind one kind one. Okay. Once I finish this one-of-a-kind handmade picture book, I'll have less to deliver it to my family. Okay. Do I have enough... Time for this. I think that was just one chapter. Meeting with the Planting Company. Today I will be having a discussion with the Planting Company. At third bill, I left the High Bishop's Chambers with letters from my family and a completed collection of mom stories. Tra -la, tra -la 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 -la. I get to meet Let's today. When I arrived at the Orphanage Director's Chambers, Benno, Mark, Lutz, and even Otto were already on the first floor waiting for me, drinking tea served by Monica. Thank you for your patience, I announced. Once we finished exchanging the usual lengthy formal greetings, we climbed the stairs and went straight into the hidden room. Yay! Let's, let's, let's! I've missed you so much! How's my family doing? Is everyone okay? I asked, leaping onto him as soon as we were inside. Let's caught me, having expected this entirely, and patted my head with a grin. Your family got real nervous when I told them you'd be stuck in the castle until summer while the Archduke's away. They thought for sure that you'd mess something up somehow. So mean! I've been doing my job there just fine. 
I was stunned by how little faith everyone had in me. The legend of me being a saint had really been taking root among the snowballs lately. So it was possible that my family trusted my capabilities less than literally everyone else. And I worked so hard to make this book for Tuli too. That book? Yeah, she turns 10 this summer, right? It's my gift to her. Could you deliver it for me? Here, when children turned 7, they were baptized and taken on as apprentices. The contracts lasted 3 years and ended when they turned 10, so in many ways, this was a pivotal, a pivotal age. Kids either renewed their contracts, signed ones with new workshops, or got taken on as laharls due to their talent. In addition to this, the skirt length for girls changed from knee to shin high. You really couldn't treat them as complete kids anymore. In Earth terms, it was like graduating elementary school to become like middle school or high schoolers instead. They were still under age, but not exactly children. For Tully's 10th birthday, 10th birthday birth season, I was giving her a collection of mom's short stories as a present. Oh, that reminds me. Tully was talking about wanting to move to Karina's workshop when she turned 10, but how did that turn out? Is she even going to join, I asked? Looking around at the members of the planting company while continuing to hug Lutz. Benno glanced over at Otto before answering. That's what we're here to talk about. We want your thoughts on it. What? At Benno and Mark's prompting, I released my grip on Lutz and sat down at the table. Benno and Otto were seated opposite me with Mark and Lutz standing behind them. You're up, Otto. The Gilberta Company's not my store anymore. So you've got to handle this one yourself, Benno said, giving him a light nudge with his elbow. Otto looked at me, but his eyes quickly began to waver. Er, I can't call her mine anymore, right? Should I just go with Lady Rosemine? Man, this feels so weird, he muttered to himself before taking a deep breath. You know, two leaves the hand contract ends this spring, right? She's got to decide on her next workplace by summer, so I asked Benno to set up this meeting. It seemed that the main topic of discussion was Tuli's future workshop, but I didn't understand how that involved me. Why did my opinion matter here? Uh, well, when you're going to be about to find out. Tuli's on the road to signing with the Gilberta Company, and we consider her a very important asset, he continued. Not many people know the circumstances behind all this, but since she has connections to you, the Archduke's adopted daughter, she'll be the most important hair stick craftswoman we have. Tilly was working hard to think up new flowers and ways to make them, and right now I was only buying hair sticks from her and Mom. The Gilberta Company wanted to sign a Laharo contract with Tully to secure connections with me, since I was one of the most profitable customers possible. Up until recently, Karina has let Benno handle the work that's outside of her realm of interest. But now he's started the planting company, taking Mark and Lutz with him, meaning she's lost all the people connected to you. See what I mean? So that's why you want Tuli and the Gilberta company? Exactly. Karina wanted Tuli and her workshop to strengthen the connection between me and the Gilberta company. I nodded, feeling somewhat detached from the somewhat detached from the whole situation when Benno interjected. We're not just talking about hair sticks here either. You thought up that new dress for your night, right? That thing's important enough that Karina's trying to stay connected to you in any way she can. Oh, I see. Very interesting. You don't really sound like you care about this, Lutz observed. I responded with a big nod. To me, this seemed like the most pointless conversation of all time. Just know this. If you exploit Tuli for the store's gain and make her cry, I'll make sure you suffer for it, I said firmly. But right now, it appears that she wants to join Karina's workshop, and Karina wants her. What's the problem? Why does my opinion on all this matter? They could simply have her sign a Laharo contract and be done with it. Otto gave a troubled frown. Everyone involved wants Tuli to join Karina's workshop, so that's naturally what we're working toward. But the question is whether she should get a Laharl or a Lahand contract. I knew from lots of circumstances that apprentices were treated differently based on their contracts. But since I could hardly call myself an expert on the matter, I looked to Benna for details. The treatment she receives will be very based on which one she signs, right? Yeah, she's like, what the fuck am I doing here? Why am I in this conversation? <laughs> right, right. The Harls are fundamentally treated better than the Hanges, but they've got less freedom, too. The Hanges could get experience at a variety of different workshops by changing locations every three years. They can improve their skills and establish a wider range of connections, but there wasn't much in the way of job security. If their work wasn't satisfactory, they weren't guaranteed to receive a recommendation for a new workshop or have their existing contract renewed. And if they couldn't find a new workplace... They really would struggle to survive. The Harls, on the other hand, lived where they worked, didn't have to hunt for jobs, and received better treatment overall. In return, however, they were chained to one store for their entire lives. Just as Zach and Johan had said, they couldn't go independent and they couldn't move to other workshops. Lutz and Mark had followed the planting company when it split from the Gilberta company, which was acceptable enough at the time, but they couldn't go back now that it was an entirely new store. Assuming Tuli does sign a Laharo contract with the Gilberta Company, the strongest chain tying her down will be you, Rosemine. 
Wait, me? I exclaimed Shep, slapping my hand against my cheeks and gasping in shock. How would I be tying her down? Never would I have thought that I'd be the one holding back my big sister, especially considering all she had done for me. A casual discussion wasn't enough. Something needed to be done, and quick. As I leaned forward, the blood draining from my face, Lutz laughed and dismiss dismissively waved his hand. Nana, you've got the wrong idea. It's not that you're literally holding her back. The problem is that she wants to be able to follow you wherever you go. What do you mean, I asked, not really following his point. If you were to leave the duchy, she wants to go with you. Duh! Because that's what Benno and them were doing. After looking at Benno, Lutz gave a small nod and continued. The planting company is prepared to follow you to another city if we have to, and that means both Master Benno and me. If, you're gonna, if we're going to be printing and selling books, we're best off sticking with someone who loves them as insanely much as you do. It seemed that as I was the printing industry's wealthiest supporter, the planting company were willing to, willing to accompany wherever I went to spread the, both the plant paper guild and the printing guild. They would be very strong allies for me. And when I mentioned this to Thule, she said that she'd want to come with us too, let's explain. Up until now, both he and Thule had assumed everything would be fine once she joined Karina's workshop in the Gilberta Company. She could stay connected to me and meet with me simply by following Lutz and Beto. But now the Planting Company had split from the Gilberta Company with one, de one dealing in printing and the other in clothing and accessories. If she became a Laharo for the Gilberta Company, she wouldn't be able to leave the store. And since they were so an Aaron Fest based company through and through, they weren't going to follow any with me anywhere I went. Mm, so Thule wants a Lahange contract just in case. But, I mean, here, I'm, here I am in Aaronfest. Ferdinand said that Sylvester would never let me go, and as far as I'm aware, my future will most likely be spent, wi uh, spent wed to his successor, I said. That prediction was mostly just based on what I'd heard from Ferdinand, but with my saint legend and the printing industry spreading as quickly as they were, it was hard to imagine Sylvester ever sending me to another duchy. But that's just what the Archduke's hoping for, right? Benno asked. There are plenty of duchies stronger than Aaronfest out there. If some political forces throw their weight around, it's not hard to imagine you being forced into an arranged marriage. In another duchy, I might add. That's true, I whispered in reply. Now that I thought about it, while I had learned a lot about Aaronfest geography, I barely knew anything about the world beyond it. And most, I was aware from my retainers that we were somewhere in the middle of the rankings in the Royal Academy, where nobles from across, all across the country gathered. It wouldn't be surprised for Ben. I wouldn't be surprising for Benno's fears to become a reality. If you're gonna stay in Aaronfest forever, there won't be any problems. However, Benno continued, glaring at me with gleaming dark red eyes. What worries me more than any political power is you going on a rampage. I can already see you demanding to change your betrothal to whoever has the highest book stash. But like you rushed, just like you rushed to join the temple the moment you found its book room. <laughs> Wow! It's sad that he could be right about that. I could hardly argue back when I'd already set such a damning precedent. Maybe due to how long he'd known me, Beno had a good grasp on how I thought and acted. There was nothing I could say to convince him that I wouldn't do something like that. If you do lose control, we have no way of predicting where you'll end up, Beno concluded. Well, neither do I, really. Back in the day, the plan had been for me to think up inventions to sell while doing work at home, but I had gone on one of my aforementioned rampages after finding the book room during my baptism and subsequently ended up as an apprentice blue shrine maiden. Considering the other unpredictable events that had followed, resulting in me becoming the high bishop and Archduke's adopted daughter, I could hardly call Benno's worries unfounded. I gave Benno a big smile, trying to look as cute as possible as an impromptu distraction, but that just made him narrow his eyes. This isn't something to smile about, idiot. With that, I quickly averted my gaze and turned to Otto, eager to change the subject. So, um, the Gilberta Company wants to secure Thule with the Laharl contract, but she wants to be a Lahange so she can follow me wherever I might go, correct? Correct. Any ideas? Mmm. How about you sign her on as a Laharl and then, in the worst case scenario, open a franchise to move her elsewhere? A what now? Like... Like, build a second Gilberta company in another city and have her work there. A second Gilberta company? So not an entirely new store. Yeah, people do franchises all the time. The Gilber the original Gilberta company is in Aaronfest. So surely they could do the same in, like, another duchy, right? Right. Employees of the Gilberta company can come and go as they please. And communication-wise, it will be treated as the same store. That way, too, they can continue working as a Laharo for the Gilberta company in another city. 
Despite my attempt at an explanation, everyone present, most notably Benno, Mark, and Otto, looked utterly lost. Chain stores didn't exist here, and few people who lived in cities went out of their way to move to another. There were cases where the owner of, another, of one successful store might end up marrying someone who also owned a store, but in a city where you could walk from one end to the other without much issue, there was no point in establishing more than one shop for any particular business. I couldn't blame them for not understanding store franchises when they weren't even really a concept yet. Well, putting aside all that complicated stuff, I don't think it would be a major problem to give her a LaHange contract, I said. Franchising was ultimately a compromise, and my main priority was ensuring Thule could take whatever path she wanted. I, I supported her joining Karina's workshop since she looked up to Karina and wanted to work with her, but I didn't see the need to bind her to the Gilberta Company for life. You want to secure Thule as a Laharl for your own sake, not hers, right? I asked. Well, if she intends to follow me, I can prepare a workshop for her at the snap of my fingers. I would be happier with her having more freedom as a Lahange. I had no plans to leave Aaronfest unless I was forced to marry someone from another duchy, and even in such a case, with mine's earnings and the money I had now, I could afford citizenship, a home, and a workshop for Thule wherever I moved. And in the event that I did stay in Aaronfest forever, she was skilled enough that she could use my support as the Obstrukes' adopted daughter to start up her own workshop when she got older. There were plenty of ways for me to support her, even if she didn't become a Laharo. Yeah, you do have the money and power to help her all on your own now, Otto murmured, his tone somewhat bitter. He had spent his entire life walking the rough road of a traveling merchant, and had taken all of his savings to produce citizenship and secure his marriage to Karina. Well, with all that said, if we assume that I am going to be staying in Aaronfest, it would be best to have Tuli to sign a Laharo contract with Karina. This way she'll receive the best treatment and have a better quality of life, I said, earning me a nod from Otto. But, at the very least, suggest franchising to Karina and see what she thinks about it. All right, I'll pass this all on to Tuli as well. The franchising stuff and that you'll set up a workshop for her if you have to, let's said. And with that, our discussion on the matter came to an end. After shaking his head to clear his thoughts, Benno leaned forward. All right, that's enough about Tuli. I've got a request for you as head of the planting company. I've made all the preparations to send Lutz to Ilgnir. Could you make the arrangements with Gabe Ilgnir? Hmm? Are you going to be okay doing business with nobles? I seem to recall that he had, so, had had so much more business business with nobles recently that didn't, he didn't have enough people to meet with them all, leaving him unable to send Lutz off on a trip. Benno scratched his head and gave a vague grunt. From behind him, the previously silent Mark spoke up, his dark green eyes crinkling in a smile. The Lahange is sent from various stores to work for the planting company are all the best of the best, he explained, which is allowing us to handle business with nobles more easily than before. We now have a few hands to spare. It seemed that the Lahange is sent to redistribute Benno's monopoly among their own stores were so extremely competent that even Mark was impressed. Thing is, the planting store doesn't have many products, Benno continued. The more new goods we have that catch the attention of nobles, the better. And when it comes to getting info out of you to make new things, there's no person I want there more than our Laharl Lutz. I'm the best person they have for researching new types of paper since I've made so much already. I promised to make everything you thought up, didn't I? Lutz said, puffing out his chest. With the printing press complete and the picture books getting finished up, it's true that now is as good a time as any to start thinking of new products. I'll be able to speak to Gib Ilgner sometime around the next Starbine ceremony. That's sooner than I expected. I thought we'd have to wait until winter socializing at least. Gabe Ilgner was informed that Bridget would be debuting a dress I designed at the Starbine ceremony and decided to come to Aaronfest to see the reveal. I believe I should be able to use that opportunity to send the planting company to Ilgner to start researching new potential materials for paper. <coughs> Ilgner was personally invested in this matter since he wanted to strengthen his connection with me and secure more export opportunities. Given our respective statuses, he couldn't refuse my request regardless, but he certainly wouldn't want to. All I needed to be careful of was making sure I didn't accidentally force him outside his comfort zone by misusing my authority. Alright, I'd assume that you can only talk to long distance nobles in the winter, but if this is happening in the summer, I'll need to hurry up with the preparations. That said, Ilgner's so far away that if we're going to be doing research over there, we won't be able to return to Aaronfest for some time, I mused. Are you sure the planting company will be okay for that long without Mark and Lutz? No matter how skilled these Lahanges were, surely it would be hard for Benno to manage things all by himself. Hearing my concerns, Benno gave a bitter smile and shook his head. Mark will be staying behind to help run the store. In his place, I'll send one of the Lahanges capable of dealing with nobles. Does such a person exist, I wondered, furrowing my brow as I failed to think of anyone who could take Mark's place. Who are you sending? We'll be traveling to Ilgnir on my high beast. Will they be able to handle that? 
That won't be a problem. He actually knows who you are already. Wait, who? Who is it? Is it Leon? No, Leon's a Laharl. In fact, he was saying that he's seen and spoken to you before. Who? At that, Ben Omar and Lutz all exchange exhausted looks. Hearing that this person has supposedly met me already just confused me even more. I barely knew anyone back when I was a commoner, especially not as an apprentice merchant capable of dealing with nobles. I have no idea who you're talking about. Who is it? Damien, Frida's older brother. The ever-profit-hungry Othmer Company had sent Damien to the Planton Company as a Lahange. It seemed that Freya had lit a fire under her brothers, demanding to know why they wouldn't do everything they could to get involved with Lady Rosemine's new business if they claimed to be good merchants. Oh, right, I did meet him once during Freda's baptism ceremony. In fact, I met most of Freda's family when I stayed at the, at the Gilmaster's place that one time. She has two older brothers, but I barely remember what either one looks like. What I do remember, though, is that they were all very assertive people who didn't listen to what others said at all. And you're exactly right. He's got a sharpness for profit and is about as pushy as can be. Oh, boy. Poor Lutz having to deal with that guy. Judging by Benno's expression, Damien was probably working in the shadows more than anyone else to maximize his own profit within the planting company. Everyone said that Freda resembled her grandfather, the Guildmaster, most of all, but her older brother Damien was no slash himself. Lutz, will you be okay with him? You won't let Damien talk you into a corner. I asked, and I worry now directed at him. I wasn't sure whether he would be able to resist Damien's manipula manipulativeness on his own, and seeing that he was just as concerned, rather than puffing out his chest with confidence, he let out a dry laugh and shot Benno a worried look. I'm concerned about Lutz as well, but removing Damien isn't an option, Benno said. Why not? He's one of the best when it comes to dealing with nobles. He knows how to hand hold back on something to make more money down the line, and most importantly, he cares more about the invention of new products than selling existing ones. I also can't turn down that old geezer. He and the other swords are forcing Damien on us to keep an eye on things. Plus, he's been oddly cooperative lately. I bet I'll need to return the favor a little to keep things that way. I'm going to come with you on the first trip to Ilgnir to establish the Plant Paper Guild and sign some contracts as its representative. I'll leave Wes and Damien there, then accompany you when you return to Arenfest. Nothing we can do from there but lay some groundwork and prepare. Please prepare whatever you can for Lutz's sake, okay? From there, we discussed the money that would be made from producing a plant paper in Ilgnir. We wouldn't be able to negotiate with the Gieb if we didn't have it all worked out beforehand. I wrote down how the products would be profits would be divided between us, notes for our stay in Ilgnir, and what demands and conditions to bring to the table. Okay, so we're sure that Lutz and Damien will be going to Ilgnir with us, right? I asked, looking over my dip take once everything had been settled. Let's raise the hand into the air. Um, I kind of want to bring a few gray priests used to work used to working in the mine rosemine workshop with us as well. Is that an option? I can't really make paper on my own, and I'll suffocate working along with alone with Damien. We can prepare the tools ourselves. We just need the nuke the manpower. My official reason for visiting Ilgnir is to research plant paper, so of course I'll bring some of my workers. You and Gil can decide on whom. That's good to hear. Let's say with a genuinely relieved sigh. I'm the one who wants new paper researched. So I really should be going there to do it myself. I appreciate you and Gil working hard in my place, so if you have any requests, don't hold back. I'll do whatever I can for you, too. Thanks, but don't worry about it too much. Heck, I'm just looking forward to going to Ilgnir at all. Let's say with a laugh, the tension draining from his shoulders. I let out my own sigh of relief. It is a special occasion, isn't it? I hope we can find some new types of wood as well as alternatives to eight to edel to edel fruit and tram bugs. Yeah, it'll be nice if we can make new paper and get more products, Lutz said, flashing a merchant's grin. Beto nodded, adding that they really did need new things to sell. Oh, I'll definitely be making more products for you. That is, more and more books. I have plans in place to print sheet music, and come winter, you'll have a copy of Rosemine's Ravishing Recipes, I said, proudly puffing out my chest, but then I remembered something. Right, right, we're still in the middle of determining what price the recipe book should be, I mused aloud. I'm not sure whether we should base the price on what we charge Father and Sylvester, or whether we should make it a limited edition version so we can jack up the price. Isn't it obvious? Go for the limited edition version. Benner replied, raising his eyebrows as though saying that I shouldn't even have even needed to waste his time with such a basic question. Mark smiled and nodded from behind Benner while he continued. Hugo mentioned this before, but your recipes require pretty skilled chefs, given that they're a real pain in the neck and take so many steps to make. Plus, they're all completely new. Of course, the recipe book shouldn't be expen should be expensive. Don't make it cheap unless you want to spread the recipes everywhere and lower their value. 
keep it premium, and gouge the heck out of them. Benno said a glint of enthusiasm in his eyes. As always, putting a high value on my otherworldly wisdom seemed to be the right call. And there was no reason for me to deny the advice of my teacher in anything business-related. Oh, he's definitely your teacher. Anyway, he continued, a recipe book, huh? Pretty sure you'll be able to sell it to that old geezer if you put in some recipes that Lace doesn't know. Make as much bank as you can here. Just so you know, Benno, you have a downright evil look on your face right now. Okay, that's it for this one, and I'll see y'all next time.